the goal of my eighth grade science fair project was to solve global warming using two aquariums, water, and some saran wrap. Looking back now, I can safely say that my research design was flawed from the outset, and the honorable mention I received was generous at best. But that curiosity and interest in using the potential of science to benefit our world has remained a thread between that eighth grade fair and today as an archaeologist and a researcher who contributes studies into human environment interactions over long periods of time. And what my work has taught me is that having scientific evidence isn't enough to solve our problems. Like democracy, science isn't a spectator sport. Now, a study last year from Science Counts showed that an overwhelming majority of Americans associate science with discovery and hope. But there's also this disconnect that exists between that positive perception and science feeling relevant in our lives, because it's said that most people would cut science funding first when there's a budget crisis. And I see this phenomenon playing out in some conversations where science is treated as distinct parts, where people separate science as process from science as practice. So imagine process as your cookbook, and practice is making the recipe and serving the food, and everybody wants a good dinner. If our goal is to serve as many people as possible with a meal that nourishes them, we would be asking ourselves questions like, what recipes are appropriate? What ingredients do we need? Who is doing the cooking? How is it being served? And as my grandmother would often exclaim, is there enough food and who hasn't eaten? So when we treat science and approach it as these distinct parts, we limit its potential to serve more people in our communities better. So I'm going to burst some bubbles here. This means that science is political, because we don't create it in a vacuum or pluck it out of thin air, divorced from our social and political structures. How we, the people, choose to wield science is like with any tool that can be used to destroy or build harm or heal us, and political decisions about science education, funding, and policies affect all of us at every scale from the local to the global. So in my profession, I'm trained to examine patterns in the past, so I'd like to share a historical example that has direct modern parallels. In London, in the 1800s, industrialization and high rates of urban growth exacerbated unsanitary living conditions. With overcrowding and a deplorable sewage system, waste often flowed into untreated drinking water. Meanwhile, cholera epidemics were devastating entire neighborhoods in the mere span of days, and public mistrust in the medical profession reached such a pitch that cholera riots broke out. So the social and political climates were incredibly tense, and a lot of people were weighing in about what was happening, but nobody really knew what to do or how to fix it. So at the time, the most respectable theory on the cause of cholera explained that it was due to miasmas, or poisonous gases. And a doctor named John Snow, who's now heralded as a founder of modern epidemiology, went against the social, political, and professional grain by making a scientific case that cholera wasn't transmitted by bad air, but rather from living organisms and contaminated food or water. Now, he first developed this hypothesis after examining sick patients in an outbreak that happened in 1848. And in the course of those investigations, he incriminated two London companies with servicing their clients with polluted river water. And one of them actually did end up switching their source water and started filtering it about a year later. Snow also self-published a 39-page pamphlet describing his evidence and reasoning, in which he even engaged in some language acrobatics to avoid certain trigger words, like germs, because germ theory was so unpopular at the time. 
Well, unfortunately, a lot of people didn't buy the book, but he persisted. He started giving public lectures, and he continued to hone his hypothesis over several years. So then when another outbreak erupted in 1854, Snow went and systematically and with painstaking detail collected data on hundreds of deaths at great personal risk to his own health. Using simple tools of science, he accumulated undeniable evidence to not only support his hypothesis, but also to identify the proximate cause as coming from one public water well on Broad Street. Now, he could have stopped there if he wanted. He could have kicked back and thought, given enough time and on the strength of my evidence, surely other people would reach the same conclusions. But science has another role to play besides generating knowledge. Science, in practice, can serve as a sentinel to sound an alarm to threats in our communities. So Snow convinced skeptical officials to turn off the pump. And then when they investigated that well later, they discovered that there was this nearby unrecorded cesspit that had been leaking into it, vindicating his argument. Well, it seems like a happy ending. Snow left a legacy in the field of epidemiology and in the science of public health. And he serves as an example of science marrying process and practice to better meet its potential. But I want to say one more thing on it. It took a really long time for his idea to be accepted. Even when other scientists discovered the organism that causes cholera, the social and political climates continued to resist. That science can never have all the answers all at once with 100% certainty has been a blunt and well-worn weapon used against it by people in the past and today. Science isn't handcuffed to labs or ivory towers or offices. The methods of science belong to everyone. And while only some are in positions to determine whether and how science is institutionally practiced and applied, the consequences of those decisions are shared by all of us in our communities. Today, our human population exceeds 7.5 billion and is forecast to reach almost 10 billion in 2050. Global connectivity and the ways in which we are interdependent keep increasing. So the world is being made both bigger and smaller, tantalizing us with the promise of greater human collaboration while giving rise to the potential for conflicts and ideological confrontations. This could be both exhilarating and frightening, but it doesn't need to be paralyzing. Science gives us our best guide to reduce inherent human biases and provides us with a structure of reaching a shared understanding and empowers us with a collaborative roadmap to address and solve our problems. Now, more than ever, when uh, misrepresentations of science are publicly abundant and paid merchants of doubt contradict good science in order to serve powerful agendas, we must engage in courageous public discourse and in our civic responsibilities to insist to those in power and to each other to let science serve and serve us better. This year, I felt that call to action more than ever, and I wasn't alone. On April 22, 2017, on more than 600 locations on all seven continents, more than one million marchers united in a great show of public support to promote science and to champion for a stronger, healthier relationship between science and society. Like snow, that march made history, but the journey doesn't end there. When science is heard and not silenced, understood, not denied, when we can better bridge the gaps between having a cookbook and feeding people, then we'll open more doors for science to reach its potential as that enterprise deserving of the hope we place in it. 
but it's up to us, and it's a big kitchen. So let's get to work. Thank you.